Welcome to the Unlearning Economics stream. Uh, I have with me today Dr. Erin Hengel, and Erin is uh, a research fellow at the Social Research Institute in uh, the University College London. Um, and she did her PhD in economics at Cambridge, and her specialities are applied microeconomics and gender economics. So that's most of what we're going to talk about today and i'm sure some other stuff as well thank you very much uh for for agreeing to come on the the stream erin thank you for inviting me um Hello. <laughs> uh so so let's let's just start with your recently published paper in the economic journal um which i think showcases both of your your research interests right applied microeconomics and gender economics so what what this paper is it's really really meticulous it's an, it's a very detailed depiction of how more is expected of women during the publishing process in economics right exactly yeah so um uh yeah basically uh what it does is it looks at particularly the mention of readability and it it questions whether women's papers are more readable um, than men's papers uh, conditional on being published in an academic journal, a top economics journal. And it kind of uh, establishes several uh, stylized facts. Like, for example, yes, they, are, they turn out to be actually uh, more readable. Uh, they become more readable during the process of peer review. Uh, you also see that female researchers, um, as they publish more papers, their papers then become more readable compared to male author papers. So over the course of their careers, women's papers then become more, more readable compared to men's papers. So then I, I developed a, a, subject, a, a model of using subjective expected utility theory and try to explain it within the context of that. And, I, and using, using that model, I, I um, argue that it basically is evidence of higher women being held to higher standards. And as they're kind of learning these standards that they're, that, that they're being held to, they're then updating how they then write their future papers. Cool. So, that, so, so it's the measure you use is like, the quality of the writing in the paper, right? And like you said, yeah. you've got like, it's, it's like, I think six, six main findings by my count. Um, and essentially the, the, the kind of headline, headline finding is that women's papers are more readable than men's by these metrics. Uh, but yeah, conditional also, on publication. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go on. Carry, no, carry on, please. Just conditional on publication in a top economics journal. Right. Okay. So the women's the women's papers within um, within these top journals are uh, are more readable than the men's, and you mm -hmm. also seem to show the 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 gender gap in the readability increases during the publishing process. Right. So from mm -hmm. sending it off to the journal to actually getting it published, women are expected to push up the quality of their writing more than men. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we also, another uh, finding in there is that women actually also spend substantially longer under review. So uh, in the two journals where we have the, the data, it's about uh, six to nine months longer. Okay, yeah. So, so right, so firstly, it's, it's quite, it's interesting because in, in a way it seems like such a, a, a small topic, right, in, in the sense that it's just one aspect of how women are discriminated against in economics. But there's so much that you, you find with this, right? So firstly, women just publish less in the top economics journals, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And and then when, when they do publish, they're kind of held to higher standards. And like you said, their uh, papers are held for longer. They have to wait longer. Um, are there are there any other are there any other sort of little details of of how women are treated differently? In that paper, I think that's uh, kind of um, uh, kind of the extent of it. But then I have some other papers that kind of are kind of mm -hmm. going along this 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 same theme. So then I have another paper uh, which is um, you know moving beyond just kind of narrow idea of readability and actually looking at something that that is more what we think of uh, akin to actual quality, which is citation. And so again, it's looking at um, papers uh, that are published, conditional publication in a topic and external. It finds that in fact, women's papers are also um, higher quality in the sense of, of, of being um, having more citations. Uh, uh, and we find that both on kind of the aggregate level, 
But then also when you look at individual researchers, you see that the same researcher, when he publishes a paper in a top journal that is co-authored with a man, it's cited less than when it's co-authored with a woman. And in fact, if you take um, very top researchers and you take an instance where they have, have co-authored papers with junior women, and that same researcher has also co-authored paper with a junior man, when he co-authors a paper with a junior woman, that paper is cited more than when he co-authors a paper with a junior man. And then at the same time, we also do not find evidence. So basically, we then develop a theoretic uh, kind of a, a framework in order to, to, to investigate this. And so we find this, this evidence. But of course, there's a huge sample selection issue because we're just looking at papers that have been published in top economics journals. But we also find that the variability in the um, uh, conditional publication, the variability in these citations is not actually higher amongst women. So if we assume a normal distribution, then that would suggest, in fact, that women are being held to higher general standards. If we assume, again, the focus citation for appropriate practical quality um, in the peer review process. So that would then be kind of evidence of using a more general and broad-based uh, indicator of, of quality citations. And then I have another paper um, that looks at, so we got data from an economics journal, a, a field journal, um, that is uh, energy economics. So we have the, like the detailed data on the papers that it publishes. So both like the amount of time that they actually spend in peer review um, and kind of all of their publication metrics. And we find that in this particular journal, female author papers uh, spend about each round of review, they spend about four, uh, four to six days longer um, in peer review. And they also go through more rounds of review. And in total, actually, this ends up being for the entire review process, conditional on acceptance, female author papers end up spending about six weeks or so longer in peer review at this particular journal. Now, one of the interesting findings, however, in that particular paper is that we see that it actually goes down as they are being reviewed by referees who have more experience. So we interpret that as a kind of evidence of statistical discrimination. And we're defining statistical discrimination here very broadly in the sense that situations in which you do not, somebody is discriminating because they don't have perfect information, okay? Mm -hmm. And so these could be based on accurate or inaccurate uh, beliefs. But what we, we theorize has happened is effectively that as these researchers become more, or as these referees become more knowledgeable about the peer review process at energy, energy economics, and as they um, uh, uh, kind of become more confident in their ability to do so, they actually end up discriminating less. So they end up, they they end up using fewer cues, perhaps, um, that are proxies for quality, but somehow disadvantage women, et cetera. And so we interpret that as, as statistical discrimination. So it's kind of evidence, in fact, that maybe kind of one of, the ways, one of the ways that we can end up fighting this is actually by having people who are a little bit more knowledgeable on the process actually reviewing uh, papers that are more uncertain or likely to be mo more likely to, to suffer from this kind of discrimination. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, so just to, for everybody to, um, who maybe isn't 100% sure what the theory of st statistical discrimination is, it's basically the idea that on average, um, some groups of people might be expected to be less productive or less able or you know basically inferior on some characteristic let's say writing papers um and there might be an expectation that women are less good at writing papers for you know whatever reasons of his historical discrimination and so what you're saying is that actually that is more true of like the junior people who are who are refereeing these papers right so they're basically less experienced so they're taking these kind of crude cues um and discriminating statistically against women well that's that's kind of a narrow interpretation of statistical discrimination statistical okay. discrimination um uh the way that i would interpret it um is basically a situation in which um anytime you treat one group differently from another group because you don't have perfect information right so uh, you can envision ways that wouldn't necessarily be just based on biased belief or unbiased belief. I, you, you could think like maybe um, uh, like if you think that somebody else is going to discriminate, that could be interpreted as a, firm, uh, a form of statistical discrimination. But obviously, if you had perfect information, you wouldn't have to rely on others' beliefs. Um, uh, you wouldn't have to estimate or you, uh, estimate others' beliefs. Or in fact, if you think about it, if you have perfect information, then others' beliefs will exactly correspond to the truth. So your own beliefs about their beliefs will exactly correspond to the truth. So um, it could also be, you think about like, um, uh, there's this um, Egner and Kane, I 
I'm 100% sure if I, I I think it's pronounced eggnog cane. Basically, um, there could be many, many different reasons why, for whatever reason, you you just find it harder to interpret the papers written by one group as opposed to another group. Okay, so this could be because their writing style is harder for you to interpret. Um, this could be because they use things like um, maybe they don't use it. Maybe you're very familiar with equations. Um, and they don't use equations, so it's harder for you to estimate their, their, the quality of their paper. Or maybe they use too many equations, and you're not familiar with equations, so it's hard for you to estimate the quality of their paper. Um, and, and then, again, where that comes into this like in, is information content, it's like if you have perfect information, obviously that wouldn't be a problem. But the fact that you don't have perfect information, you then have a harder time evaluating their papers, right? Or, again, it could be biased beliefs. It could be, um, it could be true beliefs, or it could be these other kind of other factors in there that actually aren't really about bias uh, mm. beliefs at all, in a sense. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's so it's basically you're you're saying statistical discrimination is like more like any type of um, cue you take uh, about about a group um, in absence yeah. of, of better fine grained information about about the individual exactly. within yeah. that group. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That that. That makes that makes a lot of sense, um, and and also what you said. I mean, earlier you were talking about something which I've heard called the superstar effect, right? Which is basically the 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 women who basically get through this biased process, this process which is biased against them. Typically, they they're producing work if they actually get through, like you said, conditional on publication that is better if you measure measure by citations, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, when you measure it by citations, uh, yeah, female authored work conditional on publication in a top journal, right? Uh, that's then it, we we do, yeah, it, it's pretty consistently, yeah, it, it's it's uh, higher higher quality, uh, higher citations um, when measured in terms of log citations. Um, if you look if you look at it in terms of actual citations, there are a small number of superstar men that might that mean that it's you might not get a statistical that. Well, um, once you control for the Matthew effect, which is what you're basically talking about, yes, women always have higher citations um, than men conditional top time publication in a top five journal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's yeah, it, it's it's interesting because it's the superstar effects. Like, basically, it's almost because there are more barriers, right? It's like what gets through ends up being better. So you you see that you see that in other areas, don't you? You see like um, perhaps in ma male dominated fields, let's take law, for example, you know, the women who actually manage to get through um, and, you know, become what become top lawyers um, that, you know, they're they're really, really good. Right. Because because they had to, to go through all of that to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, you think about a top five journal. I mean, the, the, the fraction of women is tiny. It really is. Uh, I think it's hold on in my data. It's something like. Um, I think 11% of all authors, uh, you know, even in the, la the last year of the data, it's only 15% of the average share of female authors is just 15%. I mean, so the, the women who are actually getting published in these journals, uh, and especially the women who are repeatedly getting published in these journals, there's something, you know, special there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you, you speak in the paper a little bit about, or you investigate, I should say, um, blinding. The peer review process so this is this is something that's talked about quite a lot when we talk about discrimination right can we basically remove the discrimination at least in some respects by just not showing uh whoever's um in this case peer reviewing the papers or employing somebody not showing them the names and other details so that they don't know the gender, the race of, of, of that person. So there was an experiment done, a literal experiment by the American Economic Association with blinding rights. So, so did that help at all? I think at the time, uh, uh, so, so it was a tiny sample, unfortunately. Um, and you have to imagine like how many people were actually being, how many papers were being submitted during the three years that was being connect, conducted and, um, uh, how many female author papers are actually being submitted. And I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but I think if you, if you don't consider it, like whether it's, you know, statistically uh, significant, uh, there, it did actually improve things, but that's not statistically significant, right? But it was also mm. a teeny tiny sample because there just weren't that many female authors submitting papers or papers mm. with female authors. 
Um, so that was a big uh, kind of an, an issue there. Now, let's let's suppose that it did. You know, let's suppose that that result was was, was true, and if there had been a, a bigger sample, they would have it would have been um, uh, clear. Uh, I think it would have worked then in economics um, because you know that was before the internet because uh, that study was shown in to what took place in like the early 1990s. Um, I think now we're operating in a different system. Uh, now other fields they have a much quicker time to publication uh, and it's it's much more reasonable for them to have a blind peer review process. They also have they're huge fields, right? So it's very unlikely that they're going to actually end up sending papers to. Uh, people that are going to already be familiar with that paper. Um, and again, these papers are, they're, sometimes they're embargoed. So, you know, you can't post them on your website or whatever. Um, and if, you know, you send them off as soon as, as soon as you've written them and they generally get accepted within three months. That, under those conditions, the app blind review is fine. Um, I think other conditions, you, it may not be as, as useful. Uh, I think in economics is probably not as useful. I mean, we all put our, I mean, first of all, you know, peer review and economics takes even without the gender thing, okay, which which I do show, they're you know they do spend longer in review. But even without that, um, in econ papers spend forever in peer review, especially at certain journals, um, and it, they have extremely low uh, acceptance rates. So you have to kind of you have to submit to many different journals, uh, go through you know and wait several months before you get rejected, and then you submit again. That whole process takes a long time. Um, people, you know. You, in the interim, you're presenting a lot at seminars. You're presenting at um, uh, on um, uh, at, at conferences. You're giving, you know, switch talks like this, <laughs> where you're talking about your unpublished research, yeah. um, and you're posting your papers online. So, I think it's, for example, for my case. I mean, I, I think most people who are going to reference my paper have probably already kind of vaguely heard about it. You know, I would imagine that it's, you know. I, I don't see how, um, I know when I referee papers, I, have, I usually have a vague idea of these papers, right? So it's, and I've already heard about them and I know who the people that, I don't necessarily know them individually or know exactly who they are, but I, I know um, of them or whatever. And I, I just, I'm not sure how, how blind review would really help you if you already have that information. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it might be better to focus on that. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can't. It, it, they're really they're badly kept secrets. Basically, the authors of economics papers, right? It's just because the process is so long of getting it published, and then you start, you know, advertising it elsewhere, uploading your paper online, talking about it, and then the referees are probably just going to find out, right? Uh, whereas if the you don't have a culture of publishing online, and if um, the the peer review process is much quicker, which is the case in most other subjects as far as i'm aware then blinding blinding would seem to work so so i guess yeah you, you kind of hinted at it there uh but if if blinding maybe won't really work in economics then what type of solutions do you propose to the, this kind of problem i think people kind of want like a, a magic bullet here yeah. um I don't think there is a magic bullet, right? I think this just means being aware of the problem and uh, uh, making a concerted effort to 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 have more um, to publish more papers by women, right? Like I think what we're really talking about talking about are marginal decisions here. So um, I think in this perhaps might be easiest when you think about like an hiring decision. So when you're in a hiring decision, you usually have several candidates that probably you know you could make an argument in favor of one candidate or an argument in favor of the other candidate. Um, it just, you know, uh, now you may prefer one candidate over the other, right? But you could, there could be a reasonable argument why the other candidate would be preferred over the, over the first. So, um, you know, I think probably what really is happening is the you know, it's, it's, if you, let's say you have a group of, of, of guys that are hiring, um, and they interview several people and, you know, who's going to be doing the research that's closest to theirs or is going to, they, they're going to seek fit closest into their, their cultural group. It's probably going to be another guy, right? But that doesn't mean that they don't, so they're probably going to fight harder for that guy than they are going to fight for that woman, um, especially the more kind of male dominated they are. This is pure hypothesis. I'm not mm. suggesting that this is, but um, so just kind of like being aware of that and then thinking, okay, but it's, you know, what about this woman over here? You know, she seems pretty good though, still. And we really do kind of need a woman, and there's no reason she's no she's, she's certainly no worse than this guy. And then making yeah, doing that kind of stuff, just being aware that there you don't have any women, you probably should have some women here. 
Um, and then just trying to make an effort to have more women, right? It's, again, and it's really just right. It's not like we're faced every day with all of these decisions that have a, a huge degree of, you know, it's not like you know exactly how to rank people or how to rank papers, right? There's a lot of a huge degree of ambiguity there. Mm. Um, and use that opportunity uh, to try to hire and publish more women. Uh, mm. Just because, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, that's when statistical discrimination, right, that you were referring to earlier, that's when it's at its strongest, right? Because people, there's so much ambiguity or uncertainty that people basically don't know what's going on, so they'll just fall back on other cues and old habits. Exactly. That's what, that's what it is. It's, just, it's falling back on old habits. It's, it's kind of going for the easiest candidate. It's, um, it's not looking very hard for a woman that would, that would perhaps be a good fit into your department. Um, uh, it's just doing, the, it's doing what's easiest. And, and instead, what I'm saying is try a little bit harder. What about things like, because you were talking about the length of um, peer review being longer for women. You know, what about, and this opens up a bit of a can of worms, which maybe we can, we can talk about, but what about sort of imposing, you know, something more uniform standards on that kind of thing? How long that's allowed to take? Uh, yeah, I feel like that's going to backfire. Okay. I would say tread tread carefully, my friend. Yeah. Um, so uh, I mean, obviously, like, in, in what we show in our own paper is uh, the the one using the energy economics data um, is that uh, this is if this is indeed statistical discrimination. It's you know you have these like novice refer pe referees who've never really not, uh, refereed before, and they're you know they're going into it. They don't really know. They're 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 unsure, and so you know they're taking the most time that people are the most sh unsure about for whatever reason, right? Um, and so if you just end up saying, well, no, you have less time to do that, it's, it's very possible they may just end up rejecting those papers. So, I, I mean, I don't know that, right? I mean, but it's, uh, I, would, I would say that that seems to me like a very plausible possibility. Um, and that's why, so we suggest that there again is, you know, we, again, we really see that this, this goes down as papers are reviewed by more experienced referees. So we, we think perhaps a better solution might be um, and it, uh, to um, have people who are more experienced referee the papers that are most likely to be subject to physical discrimination. Um, and at the same time, it's probably an argument to kind of have, it might be an argument perhaps to have, um, maybe we shouldn't referee so, because cause part of what's knowing, like, from, from my perspective, like when you're refereeing a particular paper, it's, it's not just like, Knowing if this is high quality or not high quality, it's like is this, is this a good paper for this journal? In this particular time, you're like referring for a journal you've never even refereed before. You've never even published it. You've never even read a paper, in, right? So you're like, I don't know if this is the high quality. Is this is the standard of this particular journal. Um, and so you have to go and kind of figure that out. And so you know, so when we, we define referee experience, we're looking at experience with respect to that particular journal. And um, some people referee over and over and over again for the same journals. And we're saying that they actually, you know, do this kind of uh, discrimination less. So maybe there's an argument for having, you know, focusing more of your time on a smaller number of journals instead of uh, going to a lot of different journals. Or there might be, you know, an argument for um, journals themselves, perhaps, uh, to, you know, try to give more guidance. So I know the Institute of Physics does this for their journals. They, they have this, like, peer review certification program um, where they have, uh, they offer the opportunity for journalists for people to um, kind of go through a certification program to understand, uh, you know, what the refereeing process is at their journals and how they're supposed to evaluate papers, et cetera. And this might be helpful for the most, you know, kind of neophyte uh, referee. Um, it also uh, uh, might mean that, you know, journals should work a little bit harder on getting kind of repeat referees. Um, anyway, all of these are just suggestions. Uh, and they're, you know, they obviously need to be, uh, you know, I, would, I wouldn't, throw them out like mass <laughs> i'm not suggesting that every journal needs to, to do this right now and they, they definitely need to be more tested but I, I think that that might be um with the information i have the better way forward but again you know you can test these things and see see which one's a better idea and there should be more of that yeah that's a very that's altogether a very measured um economist response right that was uh, yeah uh it might backfire be very careful um 
these are just suggestions and uh, make sure to test it test all of it uh, i mean i i guess there's there's lots of directions that that we could go in here because this touches on quite a few different topics um rather not just you know women publishing in economics but i think for a start it pu touches on publishing in economics in general right um so i i because I, you know we've followed each other on twitter for a while and i see you tweeting about the general system of how economists produce knowledge and how they they publish papers and i was just wondering if you had any any more general thoughts um uh, on you know the ref and the whole research process and the hierarchies and economics journals and how how that relates to this yeah where do i I will tell you, I, first of all, can I just apologize? Because you, you made me remember one time on Twitter, I thought you could, you have like an icon that's like that Hayek, that like, you know that Hayek? There's a guy who's, who's like crazy about Hayek and he's oh, always yeah. tweeting stuff. And I confused you and I, I said, I said, I said something about Hayek and you probably thought I was very, uh, I didn't, you probably didn't know what I was talking about. Cause like, I, I thought you were the Hayek guy. I actually don't crazy. remember that yet. Taking Hayek okay, seriously. Good. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's yes. it. Right? He's, yeah. he's a very strange he's, guy. He's, yeah. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um. You know. Do you know Daniel Cohen? He, he's a blogger as well. He's yeah. He's on Twitter, but he used to blog on facts and other stubborn things back in the day. But uh, his comment about 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 the the Hayek guy. He said uh, it's not Hayek I have trouble taking seriously, um, which I thought which I thought was pretty accurate. But anyway, so yeah, I, I don't mind. Uh, you're forgiven. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, but back to the rest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so, so, uh, are you? Do you know a lot about the rest? I don't, it's I, very detailed. I, I, and, I know and, more yeah. than more than I'd like to know, but please explain <sighs> it for everybody. <laughs> oh right. Well, uh, how do I do this? Um, if I understood it, I might be able to. <laughs> uh, so the research ex excellence framework is um, this uh, system that started. I don't know. Like, I think in the early 80s, maybe it's some, it was called something else then, but basically uh, it, it, it wasn't as comprehensive, but um, it evaluates research uh, for the purposes of allocating the uh, government research, or the QE funding, I forgot what, it was, I forgot what that stands for. But anyway, the, the, the pot of money that the, the government, the pot of research money that isn't tied to specific grants that individuals apply for, um, and so I guess they wanted like some sort of a way to distribute this across all of the different uh, universities and institutions that do research in the UK that wasn't um, uh, determined by political decisions uh, or, or apparently not determined by political decisions. And so they, they instituted the system. Uh, so basically it's this national exercise where they do um, so this, the, the rules for the latest ref, basically, every institution or university um, had to submit a certain number of research outputs for each of its staff. Um, and then those research outputs were evaluated by subpanels in the particular discipline as being four star, three star, two star, et cetera. And then based on those evaluations, as well as impact and environment, which I won't go into at this moment, just talk about research, um, they then uh, allocated these kind of grading profiles um, for each of um, uh, for each department in each institution. Basically, said you have so many percentage of four star research outputs, so many percentage of three star research, research outputs, et cetera. Um, and then, based on those grading profiles, as well as the impact and the environment, which were done similarly, um, then they allocate the funding, and they only allocate it to three star and four star research. So, yeah. So basically, yeah, there's a, some formula based on how much three-star and four-star research you have that they use mm -hmm. to, allocate, to, to determine how much money you get each year for research that's not tied to grades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, I mean, the, 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 the economics discipline has like quite a clear hierarchy of journals, right? It, you know, you, like you were talking about your papers about the top four um, sometimes it's the top five, depending on who you ask. And then there's, you know, another 10 or 20 and, you know, and then there's the rest, the rest of us. Um, and it's like, so the thing about the REF in the UK, the Research Excellence Framework, is that whereas that hierarchy is, I guess, kind of informal and implicit in a lot of places, 
this really makes it explicit, right? It's like you need to publish in certain journals in order for your university to get funding. Oh, I don't... According to the ref rules, technically, no. So you, okay. you don't have to... So your research outputs don't have to be published anywhere uh, for them to be submitted. They don't have to be in a... It's, so the, the way that they... The way that the um, actual sub-panels evaluate research is that they are supposed to read it and it doesn't have to be published already to do it. It, it can be any kind of a research out. You can submit a database, right? It doesn't have to be uh, an actual journal article. It can be any kind of like thing that was created through research. Mm. Um, and then they evaluate it. Now, there has, they're not supposed to use at all, and, and the rough rules are very clear about this. They're not supposed to use the uh, journal impact factor uh, where, it was, where it was published or anything like that um, to evaluate it. In the econ, um, group, they do use citations as information to feed into it. They can't, so, but they are, they still are supposed to peer review it. And that's just supposed to be like one small component of it. Now, those are the rules. I think what you're really trying to get at is how do people, like, what, to what extent do people actually, follow, are, are these cell panels actually following these rules? And, you know, are they, I, you're saying basically, I bet they're just going by whatever journal is published in. Um, I'm not on the sub panel, so I can't tell you that. Mm. Uh, but I think they're trying really hard not to. Uh, yeah, that's all I, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that everybody fr from some of the people that I've talked to, uh, and I've talked to some people on the sub panel, you know, they, they really, tr they do actually read this research, right? Mm. Um, and they really try to, um, fairly evaluate it according to their own uh, evaluation. Now, of course, we're, you know, we're really talking about unconscious things that could be unconscious here. Um, you know, there are other people obviously I didn't talk to, and who knows, they could just like go off on pure list. Uh, I, there's a lot of evidence from past rest that, you know, that the quality was very closely lined up with um, the actual place of publication, but there's also a lot of variation. I mean, clearly, like, it, it's not one for one, right? Um, so that's something to keep in mind too. Uh, I mean, we can imagine, I mean, you know, most papers published in the AER are pretty good, right? So mm -hmm. we probably do deserve a high score, right? Um, and that's fair enough. Uh, some of them maybe not so good, but most, I'm, 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 you know, most of them do. Um, yeah, so I think maybe what you're trying to get at is something like, or actually, I think you're trying to get at something more, but I'll wait for you to ask me that something uh, more. No, I mean, it's interesting, that detail, because it's funny that, that, that you say that it's not um, actually formally enshrined in the REF, because my personal experience, and I stress this is just my personal experience of two departments, is that they we're almost acting in a way as if the, the, the journals are enshrined in the REF, in the sense that, you know, you submit the highest ranked publications, right? And you're, you're very focused on whether you've got those, and those are the ones that go into the university submission for uh for funding right so it's it almost it feels like that's the criteria but actually it's not it's just you could you could in theory submit anything yeah hmm. yeah um i don't know what that is i mean i think and i i said this actually once on twitter I, somebody uh i i think actually gave me this i i said it but he was like oh that's Obviously, Kane's beauty content. But what what you have is the universities are trying to guess what the ref committee is going to evaluate as high quality, and you know that also takes a lot. So they're not even just looking at what, what they think is high quality. They're trying to look at like what are these other people thinking is high quality. Um, they don't really know. They have bad information. It takes a lot of time to do that. They've got other jobs to do. I think you know just looking at journal impact factors or at you know these journalists, it's just easier for them. I think that's probably how it kind of came to be. But that's just our problem. I don't know. Because it's yeah. definitely not the case. They, they're definitely not, they're explicitly not supposed to, right? They, mm. I'm pretty sure they get in trouble if it's found out that they actually did use like journal impact vectors or something. Mm. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, oh, wow. Okay. I, I didn't know that. So I guess it's, it's part of the same story, right? About um, the difference with, with, between men and women in publishing because you're just saying people may just end up falling back on like the easiest cue that they can find because i mean what you know what makes a good economics paper like what makes a good piece of research i mean there are lots of things that definitely make a bad 
piece of research, right? But when you're comparing two relatively good papers, it's so difficult to have like a definitive conclusion about about what's best. So, um, I mean, is there any? Do you know? I don't know how much you know about this. Is there are there any examples of people actually getting in trouble for it do, that you know of uh, for for checking the the journal ratings? Yeah. I, like in trouble. I don't, uh, I know people who, I, I know situations like my own university, they were doing it. Uh, and then I think they got, uh, I, I think they got a slap on the wrist. I, wrist, I don't know exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, because now they say they, they were doing it, mm -hmm. but I don't know the specifics of it. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do you feel that the ref and I could say more broadly, the hierarchy of journals in economics that I was talking about puts, a lot of pressure on on academics these days on academic economists um okay well i only have my own experience here uh yeah. so i think it depends on the institution um i i've heard from other people at other institutions and i don't think that they had any idea really that the ref was going on so i think it really de it, it depends on how the institution uh was actually incorporating um the ref into their own uh, kind of HR decisions. Uh, and I think when there was an explicit kind of incorporation of that, or or maybe not like, you know, black and white, so I don't think they can actually do it 100%, but if there was kind of a, a connection there, then yeah, people feel it. They feel it real, you know. And I wonder too, like, I, I, but this, again, this is pure speculation. I don't, I mean, for a lot of, I don't know. So I, I think it really depends on like how much um, rest decisions were determining, like whether people got, you know, past probation or got, uh, promoted or were forced onto a teaching contract. And if, if the university wasn't doing that at all, then I don't think it was. But if it was, then I think, yeah, I think it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I've seen you um, talking a little bit about like the, the environment in academia more generally, right? I've seen you talk about um, things like casual, casual contracts um, and like publish or perish. So I was just wondering how that kind of feeds into this in the specific context of, of, of economics. Well, first of all, I don't think casual contracts are used all because you're in an economics department, right? Um, no, no or, I'm not actually, no, no. no. Okay. Well, I don't, I think among staff members, I could be wrong. Um, I, I'm not sure that casual contracts are actually used all that much. Uh, but I know that they are used a lot in other areas, um, oh, and especially areas that get a lot of grant funding. Um, and uh, so basically what happens is, you know, these, these researchers get this grant funding and it has on there to hire a postgraduate research assistant uh, or researcher. And then um, they come on and the project goes on for a long time and they're continuing to do a lot of the work on it. And it's, yeah, and it, it seems like a lot of these grants sometimes they also like hire, you know, I think they hire like postgraduate researchers um, for jobs that really they should probably have like an, an administrator do or something. Um, uh, so then they kind of get into these tasks that aren't really like research related or their own research. Um, and so it really is like they're really being fully employed by the university and not really doing like properly tra proper training. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think the extent to which, um, I think that's probably not very healthy. That kind of, um, casual contract is probably not very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so economics actually maybe comes out um, better than other disciplines in terms of its reliance on like these kind of casual fixed term contracts. Again, I'm not I'm no expert in this area. I, I um, this is pure speculation on my. I, I just I, it, this is me just kind of having a vague idea of <laughs> the fact that my previous institution did not use um, uh, you know, short term contracts at all, um, and I think kind of rare in most econ departments in the UK to use short-term contracts, uh, uh, rare-ish, at least relative to other uh, areas. Um, and in, in my previous institution, they also, there were other areas, however, that used short-term contracts a lot, right? So, yeah. Yeah. I believe, basically, that in econ, it's not quite as bad. Uh, but again, I'm not a, I, I guess it's based on a sample size of one. Mm-hmm. 
when mm. yeah yeah well yeah uh, i mean yeah uh from my own experience i i would say it seems like like you may be right for some reason there's a bit less of a culture of like research fellows and postgraduates in in economics it seems uh that that may that may well be true um but yeah i mean but ge but generally still you know you've got you've definitely got a situation where you you kind of you have the pressure to publish right and you you have to sort of publish and even if you're on a tenure track position then you have to publish to stay stay in the game um which i guess is something which is relatively new in terms of like the whole lifespan of academia and it creates a lot of, of pressure on academics. Well, that I don't understand. Like the UK doesn't have tenure, so how do they have tenure plus <laughs> I've never well, understood that. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, they're called tenure track positions. Uh, what do you mean by the UK doesn't have tenure? Just that there's no tenure system at all? No, I mean, so yeah. if I understand correctly, basically, I mean, there used to be a tenure system that was um, uh, I, I think like in the, I was reading the document several years ago about w what it was like in like the seventies and, um, well, basically, uh, they, uh, you couldn't, you could still be fired for conduct or capability, but you could never be made redundant. Um, and then if I understand correctly in 1987, Margaret Thatcher said none of that and said, and got rid of it. And so basically, uh, at that point, um, academics actually had, they had no more or less job security than the rest of the UK. Um, in 1987, although the people who had been hired on an original tenured non-redundancy contract could keep, keep it as long as they weren't promoted. Um, but that was like 1987, so most of them have already retired. Um, so now everybody in academia, you know, you just you have the same employment uh, protections that you have elsewhere. Now, it's possible certain institutions have, for example, um, like cause they'll, they'll, the way that they do their... Um, like their HR processes, that would be in their, their statutes and their ordinances. Um, uh, and so they may actually have within them um, like special, like you, you know, special redundancy procedures that are a lot stricter. And so in that case, maybe, I guess maybe you could say that you, if you're at an institution that has something like that, then um, maybe do a tenure track position legally. But in that case, um, you might have like a, a, a kind of a tenure-ish uh, situation and you might be able to restrict it to only certain people, certain procedures. Uh, Sorry, I'd, Aaron, you, I'm cutting out a little bit there. I'm not sure if your, your headphones have like... Um, uh, Can you uh, hear sorry, me? your microphone. Oh, that, that, that was better. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so sorry. Uh, you just, you cut off in like the last last couple of sentences. I was just saying that um, I don't think most institutions have particularly strict redundancy criteria that have been written into their statutes or ordinances that would make their them offer anything that's anywhere close to like tenure, mm. like mm. it previously was defined in the UK, basically. Okay, okay. Um, but again, I, mean, I don't yeah. know. It's interesting. Yeah, so I didn't. I didn't really know that that institutional detail because people still celebrate getting tenure. So yeah, I guess it. Cool. I don't understand. <laughs> so that so they that's when they get that when they become a professor, right? <laughs> they a full professor. Yeah. They celebrate as if they've got tenure, but you're saying they basically don't <laughs> legally well i don't know i mean it, it may be at some institutions again if they have yeah. in their statutes and ordinances some sort of special something some special protections uh then yes maybe so i'm but i know that at my previous institution they had these like uh tenure track fellows or whatever um and uh but there was no t like the, the, stat the statutes and the ordinances did not give any kind of special protection uh against so it's just cosmetic or then. yeah you're just like i've got tenure. yeah but that's yeah, just that's the same as saying I'm a professor. But you you still just can, unlike so tenure in the USA is like you know so so secure, right? It's the the most job security you can probably have, um, in in any in any field that that I know of, right? Um, and you know you have to has to be some kind of gross misconduct basically to, in order for you to get fired, right? You 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 can't um, you don't you have ridiculous employment protections, but that's just not the case here. No. So, I mean, in the U.S., I don't know about uh, misconduct. I know that they can't really 
make you so it used to be actually it was you know tinder was actually stronger in the uk than it was in the us if i understand correctly because in the uk you could not be made redundant hmm. uh in the us i think you can still be made redundant uh if for example are shutting down the department maybe right, um, okay. and, and again we're, we're we're talking about things that I kind of I kind of know I don't hundred percent know. So you know, definitely go fact check this if you're fighting any kind of like legal dispute based on it. But <laughs> you know, um, but I think um, and and I and in the U.S. you can still be uh, dismissed because of conduct. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know how strict that is actually. Um, uh, but yeah, um, in the U.K. Yeah, I, I I don't understand why they. I also am, am, am very confused uh, by this kind of like advertisement of tender track position or um, everyone. Yeah, everyone. Uh, <laughs> so everyone really wants a tenure track position. I'm gonna have to look into this as well because this is pretty. Uh, this is pretty pretty depressing uh, that everyone just wants a tenure track position, but then it's like tenure actually doesn't exist, and everyone's just I don't know wrong and delusional. <laughs> <laughs> um I, would, yeah. I, I yeah um i don't i don't want to say that everybody's delusional uh but i have also wondered exactly the same thing <laughs> you're a bit more measured than me with uh with your language <laughs> so so um let let me let me return to to women in economics as well um so i have two related questions for you so we we started with the with the paper about writing quality and um, how women are more is expected of women uh, in terms of writing quality than men when they're publishing in top journals, and you mentioned a couple of your other papers. Um, are there are there any you haven't uh, mentioned yet uh, that that you that you could tell us about uh, the different ways women you know are discriminated against in publication? And also following on from that, I'm wondering, is that is there is there any good news for women in economics? I would only say uh, no. I, I think those are the 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 ones that are kind of more you know ready to to discuss. I also have a, a paper with Victoria Bateman uh, where we uh, we do this for the Royal Economic Society where we it's not really about discrimination. It's just more about the underrepresentation of women in UK academia. And so what we did is um, looked at. Um, Using PISA data, uh, which is the data that all institutions basically have to report on their staff um, for the UK, we show the representation of women in the in UK academia and economics, um, and and what that is, and like over over different uh, job types, so across lecturers and senior lecturers and um, professors, and yeah, and, and we also show it for students, uh, and we basically see that in fact, yeah, women are actually underrepresented in academia. Um, both at the, the faculty and uh, the, the student level in the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of detail actually in that, which I think is, is interesting. It might also be relevant for, for um, uh, particular students in the UK that are looking kind of, um, just, I, I think it, it, it would be interesting to anybody who is actually working. I think. Um, so I would encourage you to come. Uh, Can you see me? Can I cut out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, uh, yeah, oh. you're back. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, all I was trying to do was just give a pitch to this, uh, to the paper that's showing the representation of women in UK academia. So, in general, so. yeah, not just economics. Exactly. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Um, so that that's with Victoria Bateman. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, she, she. I don't know if everybody remembers, but she was, um, she was known as like naked brexit lady for a while because she kept giving talks anti-brexit talks um in in the new didn't she um that was yeah I, re- I remember that actually i'd forgotten about that but she's really great she has a whole book about the history of um capitalism from a feminist perspective i forget its name now uh, what, do you know do you remember the name of the book no i don't it's not something like that. You, you should have her on here to discuss it no, she has I, a new yeah, book I'd i think coming to. out yeah uh, she has another book coming out I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. I. Cool. Yeah. No. I'd, I'd love to discuss that stuff with her. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, so, so yeah, uh, so women are generally, so women are underrepresented in, in academia in general. So I'm guessing. Oh, wait, that, no, this was UK in economics. U, we just looked at economics. UK economics yeah. in general. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I misheard. I actually thought you said uh, all of academia. Right. Um, sorry. I'm... And, and that's, you've got, I'm guessing you've got like the le leaky pipeline problem right as well so you've got okay women are represent oh, underrepresented on average but then you've got okay they're probably much more underrepresented among full professors um you know slightly less underrepresented among associate professors and then they're probably um least uh, underrepresented among you know i guess um, the the kind of casual fixed term contracts we were talking about yeah, effectively. Um, although it's still pretty underrepresented across the board, and I think that there's a huge drop off from senior lecturer to professor. Mm. It's, it's, I think it's less of a, a drop off um, uh, from lecturer to senior lecturer. Um, but with also we we look at students too. There's also a big underrepresentation of women studying economics at the undergraduate level. UK undergraduate studying economics who are women. Yeah. That is weird i think i don't know i i have yeah the underrepresentation of, of female students is weird yeah, not at the postgraduate level at the undergraduate level yeah so not, and, not... and it's specific it don't no, it's specific to uk students it's like yeah you, you know it's interesting actually you say that because i so i, I was recently looking at the um sort of stem in in different countries across different countries and it's one of the things I talked about in my Jordan Peterson video. And my experience, at least, is that you've got a lot of international students in, in PhD programs. Um, you know, the, the UK is relatively underrepresented, whereas UK um, students are much more represented among, among, undergraduate, among undergraduates, right? And you might have a situation where studies... Uh, um, subjects sorry like stem and also economics as well even though that's not included in stem strictly they might be more heavily promoted in certain countries that have perhaps different associations um to men and women that we do so for example the uh, the muslim countries um and eastern european countries stand out as like not really associating men with science and 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 men with math solely as, as having much more representation of women so i wonder if it's something to do with that international the international students coming in especially at the postgraduate level i don't know if your data speak to that we needed it up because we wrote this a year ago i don't have everything done like that. Yeah. Uh, we did look at that um so we looked at Students by domicile. Um, yeah, you, UK students, uh, but, okay, yeah. You, it, yes, probably that. That's probably some of it. But it's also interesting because you, when you look at EU students, they're, that's also much higher. Like the representation of, among women, uh, among EU students studying in the UK is much higher than it is among British students. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's just a suggestion. I'd, I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah. uh, it could, it could, could potentially be the case. Uh, I mean, it's so. What, what's do you have the statistic for how what percentage of women are in undergraduate studies in economics in the UK? Yeah, I'm looking at the figure right now. It's about uh, a little under thirty percent. Um, hmm. and that's about it, that's about equal uh, when you go. To the other level as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are. I think. I think the kind of the obvious possibility is just that you know, you know female students, and this is something that I, I think it's Discover Econ is looking is um, an initiative that's looking into. It's basically trying to educate um, uh, people at that girls at school about economics and and how it's. You know, I think they they possibly have this kind of vision that it's um, just about counting the finance or something. Um, and I think that that is, um, one of the things they're trying to say, you know, cause it isn't right. You know, econ is basically studying anything about, um, the behavior of, you know, the, the economic behavior of individuals, uh, or, you know, economic agents, which is people. It's the study of people, um, in their, in their economic activity and their, uh, um, 
in their activity to make a living for themselves, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, this should cover, you know, it should be interesting um, to, to everyone. Um, so I think they're doing a lot of work there. I've wondered too, I, like I, the British, like a school, a school system, I, I always I find it a little bit, um, I think it's weird how you guys study. So I didn't do, obviously, I, I didn't, I wasn't born in the UK. Um, but when you go to school and you do your A-levels, you can do it in economics. I think it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit weird. I've never heard of uh, doing that in your high school, I guess. Um, and I wonder too, if maybe that's, so a lot of times that economic subject may be offered in kind of in boys' school more often than girls' schools, or, or maybe that's where they get this idea that it's more like a, a male subject or whatever. Uh, so, yeah. Um, if I if I could change, and this is me just, I think in high school, though, I think you guys specialize in it early. Perhaps mm. you should have more kind of a, a broader education and all taught taught kind of the same subjects and not siphon yourselves off into spe- into specific subjects so early. Uh, they do the same thing in Germany, or at least when I was I went to high school there for a little year, uh, and they do the same thing. But I don't know. Um, I think it might be a little bit too young, and and maybe you know, yeah, yeah. And obviously, you're gonna change your A level, so you know. I don't really know. How yeah, to it, you, I mean, it's funny. I, I mean, I didn't go to an all boys school or anything like that but when i did i chose to study economics at high school or a level um i think there were two women in the class uh out of you know about 20 in fact i think we might have had a class because there were two different years there may have been a class where it was one of those years where it was just men um just guys with the male teachers as well and i think the issue is that it starts to become a bit of a boys club then as well right uh so the atmosphere even if uh you know a girl were to choose to study it they go in and they just be like well this is this is a boys club i don't you know it's a really not yeah. conducive atmosphere not that it was horrible or anything but it's just a bunch of guys you know acting like guys and and i, I think it I, it must have been really off-putting i mean the the two the two women who were in one of the classes, they did see it through and everything, but I just, it seems like a fairly inhospitable environment, to be honest, to, to be, yeah, for it to be that geared towards towards men. Yeah. Yeah, that is, yeah. Um, I wonder if it's still like that, or like, but, I mean, I would imagine your, your math class mm. probably didn't have just uh, men, right? Oh God, was, the maths class was almost as bad. <laughs> in fact, oh, it was simi- it okay. was similarly. In fact, I think it was just me and my friend, my female friend. I think she was the only girl in the maths class as well. Yeah, that. Thinking back on it, you've just made me realise this. My college had a very serious problem with gender segregation across subjects because I also did uh, physics. Yeah, and, and that, that was, was the same. Too. That was the same. Yeah, I mean, we had a female teacher actually for the first year, but yeah. It, it was um, really, really segregated. Actually, thinking about it, so that yeah, it was yeah. So in Germany, so they do have the same thing in Germany, and I did math for I I took so they have like you you can take special courses, and I did math, and it was actually I think it was like it was close to fifty fifty female. I maybe it was forty sixty I don't know, yeah. but it was definitely like I, there were lots of women in that or lots of girls. I mean, were eighteen, but. Um, in that class, uh, so yeah, that's that's weird. That in, I, I wonder if it's like that for um, if it's just your school or that's yeah. I mean, I doubt it's just my school. My school may have been <laughs> particularly bad from the sounds of things. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, do you? I mean, again, I guess uh, I know you're very cautious with with solutions at this stage, but. Do you, do you have any idea how we can kind of encourage women to, to go into economics more? And, and, you know, including at the school level, you know, at this earlier level, that is probably quite crucial. Um, well, I'm going to just, I'm just going to tell you what I want, yeah. right? Not that I think this is a very good idea, nor do I have, I think you should just get rid of economics at the A level. 
Um, I don't see why you would need to know economics when you start to study it at university anyway. Uh, I think you should spend that time doing math and sociology or something. Um, and then you can focus on econ at, at university. Uh, and then, you know what, then there wouldn't be any kind of a, uh, all, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything associated with economics that women would think, oh, I can't go into that because it's only men because they wouldn't even have it undergraduate or sorry, at, at, at high school. So they wouldn't have a sorry association. So that would be my solution. Obviously that's not going to happen. So. Mm. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, it would put a whole bunch of economic teachers on a good job. I don't want it to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah i don't know they can maybe they can teach maths um yeah yeah i think it it is it is it is a very tricky one i mean i think it, it is i even see it you see it sometimes like econ so so if you if you're like a kind of econ guy or a finance guy or a finance bro right you see a lot of this language um and it's something that i think is just associated with men like being a kind of econ guy uh, and being like a being like a sort of econ 101 guy who wants to explain you know mansplain to women how hyperinflation works and that and that type of thing right i find that's a really common stereotype that i'm seeing more and more so i don't know uh I, I, yeah I, I guess changing the subject is is one thing that i sometimes think about right um so there's some uh, there's some arguments that a lot of our traditional economic measures and theories take a more male centric perspective i mean but i can i can give my opinion on that but i was wondering what if you think that that may be the case so i think um, i think the theories that you might be talking about they can be interpreted in many different ways and I think that because they've generally been interpreted by men, they have then taken on this kind of male-centric interpretation, but the theories themselves are not really mm. gendered, if that makes any sense. You can you could just as easily take a feminist uh, interpretation of the same theory. Is what I mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so one example would be GDP, right? And people always talk about how GDP, it has market production in it. Um, oh, sorry, well, it is designed to measure market production, right? And therefore, that excludes things like care and housework that have um, that are not not I mean, measured in the market. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, I, uh, this is I'm not really a, I don't, again. We're, we're going to the areas I don't know a lot about, but I'm, I'm I, you know I, I'm sure a lot of things in there are also things that are. I mean, there are things that are produced that are not necessarily produced by the, the market, and they still contribute to the GDP. Like, how do you measure things like for the government? Okay, doesn't that no? Because I guess I'll be. I'm not a macroeconomist. Let's not talk about this. I don't know 100 percent what goes into GDP. To be honest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um. All right. So, so one one other question uh, I wanted to ask you. Your your research is is very focused on women in economics and publishing, but you do you have some interesting sections in in your recent paper where you relate it to the discrimination that women face more generally, right? Um, and basically the higher standards expected of them. And I think there's this dynamic where it's women often seem to produce less in terms of quantity, but the quality of what they produce is higher. And you generalize that to a few fields. So I found that really interesting, if you could just speak to that. Um. Yeah, no, I mean, it was just that I think that was a that was just a few paragraphs. It was just kind of suggesting mm -hmm. that there may, there may be. So I think the the more general phenomenon is that um, let us suppose that you know you should, let's say let's say that you actually have um, these kinds of things in place that make it harder for women to advance. Well, they're going to find ways to adapt to it, um, and that was just some some. Evidence that perhaps they were that that in fact they were adapting it to it in that particular way in in other fields. But you can just as easily imagine different ways in which people could adapt. You know, like if you have something else in a different context, they would adapt differently. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think I think there is I think there might be kind of a general thing where women in in various ways are kind of held to higher standards. And if that's the case, and if they haven't, you know, they they will probably end up 
you know, conditional on actually seeing a woman in that role, they're going to probably end up being, um, you know, better. But then that also means that if you compare two men and men and women that are identical on on all other uh, spheres, conditional on being in that particular uh, role, the woman's going to have going to actually end up producing less because Mm. each each one of her outputs is going to end up um, requiring more time and effort compared to the identical man. So conditional on being in the actual sphere, women will be have the higher standards, and conditional on being in that sphere and being compared to an identical man, then that could com- create the situation in which they have fewer outputs because uh, they have to spend more time on each one. And I think, yeah, I think uh, some of the stuff I suggested was like in politics. Um, yeah, do you, do you mind if I read? Space? Do you mind if I read out the the relevant par- par- paragraph because I found it really interesting, and I, I didn't actually get a chance to read the papers that you cited. Uh, but it says so. This is this is just at the end of the the paper, basically. But it says most raw numerical counts suggest women produce less than men. Female real estate agents list fewer homes. Female lawyers bill fewer hours. Female physicians see fewer patients. Female academics write fewer papers. When evaluated by narrowly defined quality measures, however, women often outperform. Houses listed by female real estate agents sell for higher prices. Female lawyers make fewer ethical violations. And patients treated by female physicians are less likely to die or be readmitted to hospital. Right, so that, that's, uh, that's super interesting to me. Right? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, no, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of like... Um, these i mean there's there's, so one thing i've noticed about you know the way discrimination against women works is that it has a number of levels right so you've got for example women are generally expected not to work at all more more so than men they're expected to be primary caregivers right um and so that drops them out of the labor market entirely it means that they don't don't get paid right um, and then you've got kind of the next level, which is when when women do work, they're pushed more into certain professions, which on average tend to pay less, more caring professions. You know, think about, I don't know, nurses versus doctors as a kind of uh, canonical example. But then there's I think what you, what your research um, and this paragraph really relates to is how once even once you get into a job, even once you get into, let's say, a stereotypically male job, I guess, a fairly well paid well-regarded job like an economist or like a lawyer um women are still treated differently right and that can account for some of the different outcomes you observe especially in in terms of calorie uh calories (laughs) what's happened to my brain uh salary right yeah exactly uh it's just i mean it it, it's uh I think it would say that, like, on, on, on almost all dimensions, women, yeah, not everywhere, but in, in, they, they are often, at a, even sometimes just a slight, but, you know, a little bit of disadvantage, and this can kind of, you know, yeah. I think maybe kind of bring it back around to the mm. what you were saying about GDP. It's just, um, you know, you were saying, well, GDP is defined as, things that are produced by the market, but it doesn't actually have to be defined as only things produced by the market. It can be, it could, it could have been defined as something that was, that was broader, right? It's just, you know, they didn't, and I'm sure that if women were doing the definitions, they would have made sure that the definition included something that, that was a better representation of how they felt that they, they contributed to, to the economy. And they would have figured out some way to, it, you know, to actually get some sort of a measurement for that. And then GDP in that sense wouldn't be solely like things that are compensated through the market, but it would be this kind of, you know, this broader range. Um, or at least they would find out some way that they could measure it with the market to do it. Um, uh, but, you know, they weren't making those choices. Mm. They had less of it, yeah. So it's, it's less, it's the, the, the final definition that was decided on um, was less. The definition that was decided on was what? Sorry, you cut out then. Relevant to them. Ah, oh, okay. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, no, no, that's definitely, definitely the case. I think um, also, like, you know, you see, like, like why? So why does this happen that you have people, you know, you know, female lawyers, um, they're, you know, they're billing fewer hours, and that they're also engaging in fewer ethical violations? It's because the rules that are being applied to them, 
this is one way to look at it, is are basically kind of disadvantaged. This is this is how they're adapting to the rules that are applied to them. Now, obviously, if they were the ones making the rules, they probably would have made them so they were more favorable to them, so that it didn't kind of you know result in this 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 imbalance, um, or perhaps it forced the imbalance the other way. Mm. So it may um, be the case that women are women are punished more, perhaps for ethical violations. Would you think that would be a possibility? And that so it's a kind it of adaptive be. behavior. I think there is actually something that there is a study actually that shows something like that. about ethical violations think. in law specifically. There's a study. There's there's studies on women being pu pu punished more for. Um, breaking the rules, uh, definitely. There's like experiments done on this in purely experimental setup. You 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 can definitely find those studies. Um, whether there's any relating directly to law in practice, I I don't know. But yeah, definitely that there's like there's different rules applied to men and women, right? And and it's like, you know, w women are expected to behave a certain way that comports with traditional gender roles. You could argue, and then but they're they're in a bit of a double bind because. If they don't, then they're punished for it, right? So it's kind of a pick your poison type thing, right? Um, if I'm going to buck the rules, then I'm, I'm, it's going to be noticed, and I'm probably not going to necessarily uh, benefit from it. It's going to, it's going to cost me, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um. So, so one thing. So one thing that I, I was hoping we could talk about a little bit. Returning to the original paper, which is kind of guiding our discussion, you, you, you spoke about this at the beginning. You've got a theory section in it, right? So a kind of applied theory section, um, and you develop this little model of subjective expected utility. So there's some agent who's trying to publish papers, and they've got like a chance of publication, and then they got like utility from getting published and then they've got um they have to exert effort to to write better um effectively so uh, i mean for for people who who are skeptical of mainstream economics i guess a model like this is like a little bit of a, a little bit of a bogeyman right it's like a, a kind of um very very mathematical model and uh, people might kind of ask you know what what does this give us so I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about that model and what extra insights it allowed you to build. So uh, I think I think this is kind of getting at like the bigger issue of like why do we use models in antique cars? Mm. Um, I can only tell you why I use models. So uh, a lot of times you have something that has a lot of moving parts and you're trying to organize it. Uh, and you're trying to make sure that what you're saying is consistent. Um, and building the model is effectively allows you to come up with something, a story that you can say that has to be consistent, it's not going to contradict itself halfway through. So that particular model allowed me to come up with, you know, keep keep all the different mark moving parts in place. And then at the end, uh, you could also then, okay, well, with this consistent story, if this is something that is, you know, to, to, to see if our own situation, if this model is consistent with the data, then I have these kind of testable conditions that I can then test. Do you need a model to do that? No. I mean, a model is actually, to be fair, like a model, it doesn't necessarily need to be masked, right? You can do this in words. Um, and uh, it's, and people do, you know, many, you know, I, I felt like it, I think in the beginning, I actually didn't have a model and I just explained this in words. In the, in, actually, when I, the first draft of the paper, I explained this in words. I did not actually have a model. I included the model um, because I think some people weren't sure that my whole story was consistent. So it was like, a, it was like me trying to prove, no, this is a, this is, I'm trying to say this consistently and you can see that this is in fact a consistent story conditional on these assumptions. Um, but you don't know, you don't need a model like, there's nothing special about the model itself, right? It's just an idea that I happen to have put math to. Yeah, it's, it's, I, um, if nobody, yeah, yeah. I guess I don't, I don't really understand why people are so anti-model. I don't know. But also I, I, I think sometimes they're a little bit overused. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely come across models where I thought, I think this model is actually obfuscating something right. um and perhaps that's where it gets the bad reputation i don't know yeah yeah I mean, well, maybe it's, maybe like what, what why do people think it's a bogey like modeling is a bogey 
Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting to hear you give such a broad definition of modeling that actually includes words as well. Um, I, I think I think there's there's a few different reasons. One, one would be the straightforward objection people tend to have, which is like people don't behave this way, right? So they sort of say, look, this is just... This is just too unrealistic, even for an academic economist who's trying to publish. You know, they don't they don't know the probability distribution. They don't maximize their utility. It's too complicated a problem for them to behave like that at all. I think that when economists say people are rational or imply people are rational in a way in the way that that is implied by by your model. Um, I think that's their first objection because they're just like, well, I don't maximize my utility. That has nothing to do with with my experience. I think in some cases that is a legitimate argument. I think I think usually when I hear it, I uh, I feel like it's thrown out without actually having really considered the context and what they were. It, it was like it's just the easiest thing to criticize. Um, uh, although sometimes it really is a completely uh, legitimate criticism. Um, again, like the model itself is really just like. And I, in that particular, and almost all of my papers, whenever I have a model, it always starts with me just explaining something in words, and then I add a model later, right? Mm. So the model starts as words, and then goes to math, and then usually goes back to words, mostly to words, right? So I, I it's actually usually a process of like all words, and then a whole lot of math, and then I take out like half the math, and then and put in some more words. <laughs> um, <but, laughs> that sounds very complicated, like a very complicated process. <laughs> well, it's 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 actually you know you're. How do you, it's like it's not it, when you're writing something just down in words it's easy to not actually see all of the it, to, to not see all the ways that you actually might be contradicting yourself or um how you may have missed something um uh, that you need to consider or uh, so i think in that regard for me putting something to an actual model Okay, because it means that I'm less likely to make those kinds of mistakes. Um, and that's why I do it. Yeah, that, that makes think, sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean the, the obvious objection to the people aren't rational, I think there, there are two ways to, to interpret the people aren't rational argument, in my, in my opinion. The first is to say, okay, well, that's fine, but we, we can, maybe we can have like a, a better model or a different model where people don't behave rationally and maybe that can help us um but in that case you kind of need to be able to point to one um and i think um the second thing is to say well okay you can't interpret it literally but you don't interpret any you shouldn't interpret any scientific model too literally um and the hope is that it leads to some kind of like falsifiable prediction or you know some kind of insight that you wouldn't have got without the model um, which does seem to be the case in 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 the paper, right? That's you you kind of you make a a very specific prediction. Was, yeah, that yeah. But I, I think actually going to that rational. Um, uh, sometimes I, I wonder. Sometimes if people like when they make that argument, or maybe they're confusing like rational expectation with a rationality. Like rationality just means that from my own perspective, I think this makes sense, right? The agent from his own perspective, he thinks it makes sense. Now, from the other people's perspective, it may look crazy, right? But from his perspective, he is, this is, this makes sense. And I think most of us think that things make sense from our own perspective, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I think we do. So, right? I, I, so I, I mean, I, again, it, it, it's not saying that he is rational. It's saying that from his perspective and these constraints, he is acting rationally according to his own perspective, right? Mm, mm. Uh, given the information he has, he's acting rationally. Uh, uh, given his preferences and everything, you know, this is the way that he's interpreting the information. Um, that's all, that's all the rational. I mean, even somebody who's crazy, like they're probably still thinking, like I'm acting rationally, given the information I have and the, how I'm interpreting that information. Now, from our perspective, he's interpreting that information in a nuts way, but. From his perspective, he is taking that information and, 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 and interpreting it in a perfectly rational way. And then he's mm. acting based on that, right? Mm. So I don't understand why people have a hard time with the, that concept of rationality. Now, ra rational expectations, of course, yeah. I mean, that's, that's bonkers. Yeah. Well, knowing, knowing the whole economy and knowing everything that's going to happen in the, yeah, in the economy yeah, yeah. and every possible future state of the world, right? Yeah. 
then absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. There's different. There's different interpretations of rationality, and some of them are weaker. I think one of some of the issues kind of come from perhaps some of the political interpretations of these things that you get, right? So it's like um, people might go might go from like the rational model and maybe have historically some of the more i guess you could call them free market economists sort um they've gone from that rational model to the assumption that like people are actually behaving in accordance with a substantively good version of their own interests um and you know market prices are correct and things like that i think that's one reason for the you know a lot of strong feelings around this type of model i mean yeah i that's not actually what rationale, how it is often used in most economic models. Mm. They're not, it's, it's, um, yeah. Uh, so I, I think they're, I think, I mean, the idea that, you know, these, these prices reflect actual value or whatever, that's, that's basically, that's verging towards rational expectations here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the the more the stronger, more substantive version of rationality, right? Um, yeah, yeah, and, and it's it's changed over over the years how models are used and and how rationality is interpreted. And so, to to change subject a little bit, but not that much. Um, I just wanted to talk with about some of your other papers. So you you've written a lot about political economy, right? So you had a really interesting paper about the master lever in the in the USA. Uh, could you? I, I, so I didn't really know about this. Um, could you? Could you explain the master lever and like what what you find about it? Because it's really relevant for stories of political polarization. Yeah. So well, basically, uh, we we have a model. Well, basically, what we have is data on states uh, in the U.S. and when they implemented what's the, the so called master lever. So the master lever is this thing whereby on a ballot you have the option to just pick instead of going through the ballot race by race and picking all the different candidates, um, well, actually, let's give you some context. In the U.S., you, you, um, in the year of uh, electing, say, the president, you basically, at the same time that you go to the ballot box, you also elect your, you know, if, if your senator is up, you're also electing him, also all of your local, like, you know, your, your judges, um, your, sometimes your, your DA, uh, you know, sheriff, uh, mayor, all that sort of stuff. So it can, the ballot itself can be very long. Um, also, especially like in California, they have these um, these special uh, um, they'll have amendment or sorry, referendum uh, that you'll also end up voting on. And lots of other states have started adding that. So it's a very it, it can actually take a long time to vote. To, to vote. And it especially takes a long time sometimes to, to be knowledgeable about all these different races. So you're going in basically when you're voting, you have this possibility. And in some states, they have. They have implemented what's known as the master lever or, or the, the straight ticket voting option, which is basically at the top of the ballot, you can pick um, a Democrat or Republicans, and then you don't have to go through the ballot and, write, and vote in something race by race, and you can instead just, it will just automatically vote for everybody from the Democratic Party or everybody from the Republican Party. So basically what we did, so the question is, like, you know, how does this impact the actual uh, races? Uh, and, and, and one's tendency to vote for particular candidates. Um, and so we use a difference in different strategy um, uh, at, the, at the state level, and we show that the master level, it actually ended up, it didn't seem to have an effect on the type of candidates that Democrats voted for, but it seemed that the type of candidates, uh, the Republican candidates that were voted for turned to be a little bit more right wing. Um, and so then we have a model, um, we created a model basically kind of to, to interpret these. Mm. So, yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it, it basically, the, the basic idea here is that, I mean, the people who are going to be going through and voting uh, the master level um, are probably going to be the partisan voters, so the people who are, you know, yeah. and, and they may not, and the partisan voters, however, may not necessarily be the more right-wing, they may actually be the more moderate voters, right? Um, so if you have a more moderate voters, and, and we think, we, you know, basically with the Republican Party, you have more of these moderate voters who are probably voting more, more, more Republican, like geared towards Republicans than you have in the, in the Democratic Party. Um, so given that you have more of your moderate voters who are definitely voting for all of your candidates, your Republican candidates, that leaves the, the Republican Party members the, the opportunity to um, basically pander to their right-wing voters, effectively. 
So because they, 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 with this master lever option, they don't have to worry about, um, you know, you, the moderate Republican going through and not voting for that, that, that crazy judicial guy, the, the judge, uh, the local judge, um, who is, is nuts. You don't, cause you're, you're not even going to look at him. Um, so they can actually put him on the ballot. Whereas if you did have to go through the ballot and vote for every race, race by race, mm. you definitely wouldn't vote for that guy. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it's, really what yeah. it's. it's it was wild for me actually finding out about this because it, it, it you can just yeah say I'll 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 vote all Republican or all Democrat for every every single uh, choice and you know as a behavioral economist that sounds a lot to me like a default option right um, which is like a very easy option for people to default into um, and not really think about it. Um, and just go with like I guess this has become a bit of a theme right these very coarse cues uh that we receive in our environment and just go by group level membership and not take into account that there's this yeah this this uh judge who uh you know has some pretty horrible or wacky views about you know certain things let's say abortion right so you just end up voting all republican all democrat and that increases polarization but for you in your, your results so you look at this empirically you find that it tends to push republicans further right but it doesn't have an effect on democrats yeah, and again, we interpret that within the model, and it's, it, the, the real reason is because, um, you know, the, the 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 Republicans, their moderate voters are basically the people who are most likely to use the, the straight ticket voting option, whereas the Democrat Party, the, the people who are most likely to use the straight ticket voting option are their extreme voters, so that leaves the Democratic Party a greater opportunity to kind of pander more towards their the kind of middle, middle run, um, so that's why we see less less. Okay, so yeah, it affects it affects them them um them differently. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah because it's a, there's a there's a they have different the people who use the master lever of each party are different. Yeah, yeah. So so um, someone asked in chat an interesting question: Does the model take into account the impact of third party candidates? No. No. So you haven't looked at third party candidates at all in the data or in the model or anything. The version of the model that did take into account. So my co-author uh, that does does take into account the third-party candidates, but we that is not in that paper. Okay, okay. Do you do you know what the results of that exercise were? Or? Okay, um, your your mic's quite quiet, by the way. I think um, I don't know. No, I, I don't know if I it's when know. you talk yeah. quietly. Yeah. Um, it might be when you talk more quietly that it doesn't it doesn't pick it up or something. They might feel like they've got quite a sensitive cut off the the AirPods, and they're like you don't like sort of scream. Then they, they just like sort of cut you off or something. Um, yeah. But anyway, it's okay. So, um, so yeah, uh, I was uh, so I don't know if anybody in chat has any questions um, for Erin um one one other thing i guess to to return a little bit to my sort of last question is about these like models of voting so we were talking about modeling um and you talked about your model so these are called like political economy models right in in economics um these these models of voting and specifically i was wondering how how they've helped you and you have hinted at this to be clear but how that they, how they've kind of helped you to understand ele ele elections in general and that's a very general question but you can also be very basic with it because i don't know very much about these models and i don't think people do in chat but these models of elections how candidates are voted have they like informed your view of elections in the real world my own view of elections um, well, again, this isn't actually my, like, my main research area. So, uh, other models, I can definitively say that other models haven't really changed my view because I'm not super, super familiar with them. I have my, have my this model informs it. Um, yeah, I think it, it has in the sense that, like, um, it, it's just a way of organizing how you see the situation. And it, it to me, it makes sense. Like, you have some of these extreme voters um, that are probably more likely to go for 
And actually, this goes into the question that the, the chapter was saying. Like, we we don't have like an explicit third party in there, right? But the whole the the whole assumption there is the third. Maybe like a we don't want a party in there that's a third party, but there's other candidates that can be that can be. Um, uh, it, it just could be you know represented as a as a third party, and so you think about the Republican Party, they're saying to themselves, okay, well we know that we've got this moderate guy over here who's captured, so you know we want to go after this crazy person, and this crazy person. Well, I mean, I'm exaggerating. I'm not all Republican parties crazy, but let's just sort of take a you know. Um, you know, he he might be going for another person in the ca- in the in the party, right? But he could also be going for a third party candidate that's outside that party, right? So you know that you know, we don't simply model that part, but you could you could that's how it would basically enter into it. Um, and yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that uh, I think that, I'm not saying this is def- definitively the story, right? But I'm just you know my own experience growing up in the U.S. and and you know Republicans that I know. I grew up in the deep south. Um, they I I could see. Yeah, that's that's who um, that that would be the the kind of people that they would be um, kind of more interested in, uh, in 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 as a, as potential candidates. Um, uh, and that's the kind of thing. That's the kind of competition that that a moderate candidate in the Republican Party would have. Um, so it's kind of a little bit. Uh, yes, I think it has. Um, mm. I don't know how well. It seems like, what, and I think this is like a bigger question, like, what, it seems like, and I, I'm assuming, because you're kind of pushing at this, and maybe also some of your, your listeners are also interested, like, do they expect more out of a model, I guess? Do they, like, expect, do they expect more out of a, more out of a model? um yeah. more out of a model than than what your models delivered yeah no just like in, just what i'm just saying it's just like it's kind of a, it's an organizational tool and it's, it's kind of showing what's what's going on but they yeah i, I think um it seems like they're the, the way that you've, you've asked it already a couple times and you're not the only like other people have asked me these things too like and they're like what 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 other answer did they I think the comparison is probably to 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 natural science right that would be that okay. would be my expectation so if you take something like you know uh f equals m a or you know one of the standard sort of um newton's laws and you can with you know with certain certain uh augmentations you can kind of predict if you drop a ball from a certain height with some of the characteristics of the ball where it's going to bounce to and things like that and clearly uh uh economic models aren't on that level and they're probably never going to no, be no, on, no, on that no, level no no yeah. no it, actually that's a, yeah that, there was actually a physicist on twitter that said something that, that was, it's really like you know when you're in physics like you you move water to one cup to another cup and it, go, it all goes there right you're not losing any of it that's not the case like we're not estimating exact quantities here we're even like and, and i think he was talking about this in, in the context of like cryptocurrency um, you know, even the price of of money is a, is is a, is is a proxy. It's not the real value of it, right? Everything is we we never really have the exact precise value of anything. We're just trying to estimate it, or we're try, no, we're trying to guess what it is, right? And so when you don't have this this, this level of precision, um, the informative that you're going to get out of the model is never going to be like. It will be in a physics model where you have you can def- you have this cup of water that for all you know for for most purposes this is the same it's going to have the same measurement no matter what right it's the same thing in all circumstances um, and it's agreed on by everybody to represent the same mass or volume or whatever um, yeah we we don't we don't have that, you know, and if you move, say, you know, you move, you move an economic quantity from here to there, it doesn't mean you're going to get all of it going from here to there. It's not like, you know, some of it just evaporates and it just goes away, you know, like, you know, it, it, and I think, you know, when it goes like the cryptocurrency, like when people were like, where did the money go? And when it's just, well, it's because it was basically, you could think about it in many different ways, but basically like the, the value of the currency itself was mismeasured to begin with. And there was a correction and now, and so it never existed to begin with, right? Mm. You could think about it that way. Um, you could you could also think about it having existed and then just evaporating. But I think, I, from my point of view, I think it's easier just to think about it as like it was just mismeasured, 
And then there was a correction and now we have a better measurement. And so what you thought existed before didn't exist, right? But because of these problems, your models are never gonna be that. They're never gonna be anything more than kind of like a, a useful tool for organizing and, but to, they're never gonna be useful the way that models and nat some natural sciences are. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I get that um, completely. I think it's the best you can hope for in economics often in terms of predictions is like a kind of quite a short term, very, very um, narrowly targeted prediction about something, something very specific uh and and it's going to be you know roughly right it's not going to be right to four decimal places by any means so it's like it is it is a completely different use use of models uh but i mean you know i think also i guess one one other thing which has come up quite a lot is that when i think when people are objecting to economic models they're, they're sometimes objecting to the fact that often it's it's one particular type of economic model we see, right? So we see the the optimization and equilibrium type stuff, the neoclassical stuff it's sometimes called. And I mean, you gave a broad definition of modeling that included verbal models, right? Um, or, or models written down in words. And that 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 to me was encouraging because I, I sometimes worry that if you're going to make a model in an economics paper, it kind of has to look a bit like yours. It has to have utility. It can't be like a post-Keynesian model or, or some other type of model that doesn't have these features. You know, I don't want to say that that's totally false, but I think that there's also, if, actually, if you read a lot, like many papers, actually, they have little, they're not called models, right? But they're clearly somebody who's explaining the situation, telling the story. Um, Almost every paper has something like that. And a lot of times they don't even have explicit models in, in economics, right? So, so the, you see this actually a lot. It's not, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, maybe they're not calling it a model, I guess. But yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. That's mm. a, in a lot of papers. Mm. I'll, I'll probably every paper it has that in it. So one person in chat, so going to questions, one person in chat asks if um, this this super, so-called superstar effect, um, that's not actually what you called it, it's what I called it, but it, it, uh, the effect of kind of, you know, women producing higher quality papers and your ethical violations and so on. Do you know if that's also true for minorities or for lower income people? Do you know any studies that look into those kinds of effects? Yep. Yeah, you're 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 uh, you're not sure. I I don't I don't know I don't know either. Um, I mean, in in theory, the same would apply, right? Uh, the more discriminatory barriers you place in front of somebody, the better the people who get through them are going to be. I would expect that they wouldn't. So one of the things that's really unique about gender discrimination is is the the fact that it, it um, is reinforces traditional gender roles, right? So there might be something in women ex being expected to be more caring, and that might relate to, for example, fewer ethical violations. Um, whereas, for example, that that type of dynamic doesn't necessarily apply to minority groups or, or you know, immigrants or something like that. They might just what you find often with these studies is that they just kind of they just have a lower chance of of getting into anything. Um, whereas for women, it might be that they, in in some with some behaviours or in some fields, they actually have a higher chance of getting in because those can conform with traditional gender roles. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know. So that dynamic wouldn't be present with these, but I'm just speculating, really. I don't think either of us have any fully concrete ideas about the research on this. I mean, having said that, like I fully believe that it is present in in situations mm. where, yeah, uh, any situation yeah. where somebody faces a greater barrier um yeah if you face a greater barrier then conditional on having um if your barrier is here and everybody else's barrier is here mm -hmm. then conditional on getting past the barrier it, 
you're yeah. going to be higher, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is, yeah. It's pretty straightforward. So, yeah. I, you can yeah. do it. You know, you can make a little simulation in Stator, and you can with, with this. This is a good type of little model you can do. You can. Uh, Scott Cunningham did this. Um, um, wait, was it you who put together the Stator code for that? For the yeah. collider bias example. It was, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I don't need to, yeah, exactly. You put together, yeah. So that's like, that's a really good demonstration. Um, I don't know if you could just explain that quickly for everyone, actually, because that's a really neat demonstration of what we're talking about. Basically, it, yeah, so what was the specific? I mean, that was a couple of years ago. Um, but, uh, um, so you have uh, women who are faced to higher barriers. Uh, I can't say I, I need to draw out the um, the dad because uh, there's there's a subtlety in it. Uh, so let me pull it up mm -hmm. for a second. I think actually now he's published it. He may not. Does he still have a book on his website? Because I have to open I, the book. I don't know if it's still mm. available online. Uh -huh, I bet it's probably not. Um, and then I'll have to look for my email. Yeah, it, it was basically just like generating a population of um, men and women, and the they're, they're generated as having equal productivity, um, but the women face um, discrimination. And yeah, yeah. and when so, you didn't yeah. control on ability, then it looked yeah. like um, basically that. Uh, Without controlling on ability, you got one sign. Controlling on ability, you would flip the sign. So the question is, like, how do you interpret this? Like, this. You know what? No, it was occupation. That's what it was. Okay, it was occupation. All right. So, oh, well, right. I know. Okay. So basically, because women are held to higher standards, let's say in certain occupations, only the women from the highest ability were going to move into certain occupations. Okay. So if you controlled for, uh, if you controlled for occupation without controlling for um, but they still experience discrimination in that occupation. Um, if you control for occupation without controlling for ability, then it looked like there was no gender wage gap. But if you control for ability, then there actually will be a gender wage gap. Um, so I think that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, it's yeah, bad controls, isn't you, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's all. Slider bias is just yeah. bad, bad. I think bad control actually is two different things, yeah. uh, which includes... Uh, collider bias yeah yeah um, collider yeah. bias is a specific example of a bad control right and yeah if you control for occupation in a gender wage gap regression you end yeah. up with like a reversed coefficient a reversed gender pay gap and that's precisely because of what we were talking about right it's because you're controlling for occupation and given the occupation the women that have overcome the discrimination let's say are going to earn more because they're going to be more able Right, so so that's exactly what's going on with the collider bias, and it's the same as the superstar effect that we've been talking about. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, it's a really cool yeah. uh, um, demonstration like to, that everybody... Yeah. I like to think about it more fun and still like... Like, I, in my head, I just think about these more as, like, selection issues, you know? And they need to step, right? What you have, you have, what you have to get to here, you have this selection issue, and that's causing that. And then, but, yeah, the collider bias is another way to look at it. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so a, a, another question somebody asked, which I just thought was really interesting, actually, is um, is there any difference in the kind of topics covered by men versus women when they write articles for journals? Yes. Uh, so men are in top journals, um, which is what I'm familiar with uh, the most. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, women are more in, so women, in top, conditional on being in a top journal, women are really underrepresented. Uh, across all of them, even I mean, they don't they don't make more than twenty percent of all authors in any field, okay? Uh, but they are most uh, well represented in kind of health, welfare, and education, um, and these based on like broad uh, JEL classification codes, uh, and they are least represented in uh, kind of well in in conditional and publication in top journal, which I'm saying there aren't a lot, but actually like heterodox thought and methodology uh and yeah. then after that in in kind of quantitative methods and um macroeconomics uh yeah um so the yeah, least that, represented that, in quantitative methods and macroeconomics was that 
Yeah. But again, actually, they're the least represented in actual like B, J E L code B, which is actual heterodox thought, which I've always found fascinating because it's conditional on top economics journals. Mm. Um, and I don't think a lot of these papers are getting in there in any way. It's not a huge number. Mm. Um, but uh, it's something that I've, I, I know that I'm thinking about your audience here. So I'm just like, you know, it, it, yeah, they're all low, right? But it's, yeah. Yeah. It's it's yeah it, it's um it's not better in the heterodox community I think that that's that's for sure yeah, uh, yeah. so I, I think yeah. what I'm going to say is like it's a uh, uh, I look at these conditional publication in a top journal and they're all just so low I I find it hard to really kind of look at these field specific differences and come up with much right uh, I I don't. I think you. I think there would need to be a different data set to be able to get at that, and I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, because again, conditional and top publication, women are not really there, and actually, they're they're really not there in some of the areas where, which I find kind of surprising. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I guess um, I guess uh, that's probably a good time to finish. Um, thank you to everybody in chat uh for your interesting questions despite the many many bots advertising adult dating sites which i thought i'd managed to ban but which i haven't apparently um and thank you so much erin for for coming on and speaking about uh, well all the all of the different things we spoke about um it's been really interesting thank you very much for the invitation yeah. um so uh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna finish the stream now and um i will see you all later